Welcome to the first video podcast of the Sundial magazine, the campus newspaper of Sciences Po here in Reims. Only a few weeks ago, US President Barack Obama was inaugurated for his second term in office in Washington, D.C., and I'm going to talk to Alexandra de Hop Schaeffer, um, the Paris Borough Chief of the German Marshall Fund, today about his upcoming foreign policy. Um, Schaeffer has also taught at Sciences Po in Paris, has advised the French Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and she should be here within the next five minutes. Welcome to our first podcast here from um, Sciences Po in Reims. Only a few weeks ago, um, Barack Obama has been inaugurated for his second term in office. And that's what we are going to talk about today with Alexandra de Hoff um, Schaeffer. Um, she's the Paris Bureau Chief of the German uh, Marshall Fund, has been a foreign policy advisor for the French Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and also teaches at Sciences Po in Paris. Um, since you've done a lot of research concerning transatlantic relations, I'd like to start um, with a blog post um, from you. You wrote, one year ago, um, the United States want Europe to develop more military capacity but Europe is actually evolving in the opposite direction. Um, so now that Obama has been re-elected, I'd like to ask you, um, will Europe remain uh, one of the key points of his um, foreign policy? I think, uh, I think Europe still remains uh, a key actor uh, for uh, the US foreign policy. I think that uh, Joseph Biden made that really clear when he uh, came a few days ago in Europe and in the Munich uh, Security Conference and when he came to, to France as well. Um, Europe is not as important as it used to be in the American strategic vision or vision of the world because now they're so-called pivoting uh, to the Asia-Pacific and it's quite natural move for uh, the United States and, and they've been doing that for, I mean, several decades now, so it's not something new. But I would say Europe remains a key actor, a key partner and a key ally for the United States and we see that every day. We saw that in Libya, we see it today in Mali, the way now the United States is more willing to support a European-led, or I would say a French-led military intervention rather than taking the lead. So I would say definitely Europe remains a key ally for the United States. We've already talked about the mission in Mali. Um, uh, President Obama said um, it is necessary to share the burden of uh, military operations. Do you think the, the operation um, of the French military in Mali is exactly what you expected, what you wished for? I think that's exactly his definition of burden sharing, and I think it's exactly his definition of leadership, of the American leadership. Um, and that's the, the topic of the, the conference today that I'll be giving here at Sciences Po Reims. His notion of leadership is not um, what, used, what it used to be maybe under uh, the previous um, Bush administration, that is to say a unilateral approach where the Americans are leading in the front, if we can say. Um, the, the Obama approach to leadership is much more subtle uh, in a context of increasing war fatigue. I mean, that's just something that um, is really going on today in Washington, but also uh, in the American public opinion, but also in a context of increasing uh, budget cuts, uh, and especially in the defense foreign policy budgets. And so he has to deal with this you know, very complicated economic domestic uh, context. Uh, and therefore, his notion of leadership and burden sharing is maybe less putting the United States in the front, especially in, in zones where you know, the United States maybe doesn't have that type of vital or strategic interest. Um, and I think that the, what we call the MENA, the Middle East and North African region, is probably a region where the Americans want to withdraw a little. And that's, that's the, the, you know, the, the cornerstone of this so-called pivot to Asia, it was really to say, you know, the Americans are, have been too much engaged in the Middle East region, so now we're withdrawing from Iraq. Let's turn to the Asia Pacific. It's really the idea that we have to withdraw and, and I would say, lessen uh, kind of uh, nuance uh, the American presence, uh, maybe over um, uh, presence in the, in the region. And I think that both Libya and Mali are a perfect case study of that. Before moving on to Asia, um, which is of course a very important topic um, today, I'd like to stay in, in this region we were just talking about. Um, drones are also very important when it comes to this, um, as you call it, subtle approach uh, towards foreign policy. Um, but isn't that kind of a dangerous strategy at the same point of time? 
Absolutely. Um, I think there has been a misunderstanding uh, when you, you, know, you, you talk or describe about the, the uh, Obama foreign policy or defense policy. There's always been this sort of myth that Obama was a reluctant warrior, right? And that he uh, was against war and war making, everything that has to do with the, the military in general. I think that's proven totally wrong. He's been you know, showing several times that he is uh, the commander in chief, uh, that he doesn't hesitate to use military force. Maybe it's not the way Bush used military force, that is to say, uh, big, large military deployments as we've seen in Iraq or Afghanistan, but it's rather a more indirect use of military force. And the drones, I mean, if you look at the way the Obama administration, especially his um, advisor, who's now uh, heading the, the CIA, uh, John Brennan, have been you know, kind of putting this emphasis on drones. Drones have really become the kind of preferred tool for war making under the Obama administration. But today we see that this instrument of indirect war raises a lot, a lot of questions. And I think we're just entering a new phase of debate. Um, and probably the debate will be coming here in Europe because we haven't been hearing a lot of, um, of, um, of debate or contradictions vis-a-vis -vis the uh, Obama, you know, increasing use of drones. Mm -hmm. For example, Germany is also now debating about introducing um, uh, drones which have uh, weapons on board um, to use them somewhere, for example, in the Middle East. Absolutely. Do you think there is going to be an increasing, um, increasing that's, um, you know, that's, that's the risk. When you start using these tools and you have a risk of uh, you know, spillover, uh, that's definitely the fact. But I think it also has to do with um, you know, uh, the fact that Western public opinions are accepting less and less uh, the human cost of war. I mean, that's obvious. We've, we've seen that in, in Afghanistan. I mean, it's Western public opinions that have been accelerating in a certain way uh, the withdrawal of uh, the troops from Afghanistan by, you know, getting more and more opposed to the presence of troops there. So I think there's a real, you know, reflection to have on the role of public opinions. And I think that this, you know, sort of um, dishumanized um, a tool of, of war making is also a way of responding to this, uh, I would say, call from the uh, Western public opinions that say, well, we're not ready anymore to accept the human cost of wars. And I would say, especially in a context where the, the goals and the mission of this war have been so badly defined. Why is this happening? Is it happening because, um, for example, oil does not play such an immense role for the U.S. anymore since um, the U.S. might even become um, an energy exporter in the foreseeable future? I think that's, that's absolutely key. I mean, that's, that's really part of their rebalancing towards the Asia-Pacific. Um, as you've rightly mentioned, the United States is now um, undergoing the so-called energetic transition or energetic revolution. Um, and I think that... Um, I, around 2020, uh, the U.S. might uh, be a, the, the greatest exporter of, uh, of oil and even surpass uh, Saudi Arabia. So, I mean, these are really key, I would say, economic drivers that will have drastic geopolitical consequences. And definitely, I think that both the acceleration of the withdrawal from Afghanistan and the idea that you know, the U.S. wants to lead from behind in the Middle East has to do with the fact that they will be less and less dependent on external uh, natural resources. That's, that's really, really key. Mm -hmm. This uh, changing en en energy uh, supply will also affect um, Asia, of course. The um, US um, has also changed its Asia policy. Um, soldiers have been deplo uh, deployed to um, as, um, a base in Australia, for example. Uh, warships have been deployed, um, deployed as well. Um, Obama has visited Myanmar, India, what do you think is the future of the U.S. policy towards um, Asia? Is it confrontation towards China, for example, or is it cooperation? I think it's both. It has always been both. Uh, I think it's not new that the U.S. You know, is balancing a sort of uh, cooperation and confrontation or containment policy towards uh, China. That's not new. But to get back to the, the so-called pivot or rebalancing towards Asia, I think what's really important to keep in mind is that, and you've, meant, you know, you've pronounced the word future, I think it's really something to see in the long or even very long term. Uh, you've mentioned these you know, troops redeployment in Darwin, they're around, I think, 250, and uh, this will be a very long process. And, uh, 
um, because of the uh, you know budget uh, situation, uh, the Obama administration might never really put into place his full uh, doctrine of the pivot to uh, to Asia because it's very costly and because the American leadership is still necessary in the Middle East. We see that in Syria. Uh, we see that um, in the post-Arab revolves context because we're just starting to see the middle long-term implications of the Arab revolt. It's an unfinished and ongoing business. But you also have Israel-Palestine. So what I'm trying to say is that uh, I think if we could find a sort of uh, problematic to the uh, second mandate of Obama, it would be to ask ourselves whether uh, the Middle Eastern challenges and the calls always and always for a strong American leadership in the region, will it not impede in a certain way or at least refrain the Obama administration from fully pivoting to the Asia Pacific? Mm -hmm. What do you think, how long is it gonna take until um, the, the um, US foreign policy towards uh, Asia will be um, recognizable um, in its full extent? Um, might that take some like, I, I think it's really an issue of several decades, but your, your question is, is, has another uh, meaning to it. To what extent or when will it be recognizable? Um, I think that maybe the, 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 most, the newest element uh, to uh, the American strategy in Asia is that the U.S. increased leadership in the region will be recognized and recognizable from the moment that um, the American Asian allies feel that you know they can be strategically reassured and protected by the Americans vis-a-vis -vis the Chinese more and more aggressive uh, attitude, especially in the South Sea of China. And I'll just take a concrete example, uh, Japan, for example, um, for the first time in its uh, history is now trying to increase its uh, military budget. There is a rise of Japanese nationalism and all of that uh, coincides also with the fact that maybe you know the Japanese ally doesn't feel that reassured by the Americans in that region. So I think that we will really uh, see whether the United States is really serious about the pivot to Asia um, in the context of increased crisis with China and to see whether they are really ready to act and protect or defend their allies in the region. So I would say there's a real uh, credibility issue in the region today and, and, and a sort of pressure on the Obama administration. And China is also not only uh, focused on Asia in itself, but also, um, for example, on countries in Africa where they are cooperating with um, a lot of countries such as Rwanda. Um, should the US or will the US um, act and um, try to stabilize their relationships with countries in these country, um, on, the, on those continents or in these regions um, even further? I think uh, the Obama administration is fully aware of the, the, the challenge uh, of Africa, uh, especially in a context where the Chinese uh, presence in Africa is increasing and increasing. Uh, and so there is a, a competition uh, of, of great powers uh, on that continent. But I don't see Obama really taking uh, a more audacious uh, position. I still see him, and he makes that really clear in, in Mali and other countries, um, investing in the so-called, you know, uh, training the trainers, uh, helping uh, African forces uh, to reinforce their capacities to uh, do peacekeeping, uh, protect their population, um, and also work through regional organizations. I think this is something where Obama has put a greater emphasis is the importance of um, better equipping, supporting, and training uh, local regional forces. And that's also, I would say, in the broader context of lessening the U.S. presence and image uh, in the region and to say, well, we're acting through local partners. That sounds like a lot. Um, actually, Obama has um, very often been criticized for having no Africa policy at all. Um, can, you, can you understand this point of view? Or is it it's, it's just not his priority. <laughs> I, I think he, you know, uh, during his, his first mandate he arrived, he had, uh, I would say, three wars to really finish. One was the Iraq war, the second one was Afghanistan war, and the other one was the broader war on terror that he has been shrinking to the war on Al-Qaeda, which is a, a different type of war against terrorism. So he had these three big wars to manage, 
Africa really wasn't a priority, but also Latin America has not been a priority. And so uh, it's just not um, urgent, um, but of course he is fully aware of the you know, terrorist uh, threat in, uh, in the Sahel, uh, which is something that you know, he has been working on with uh, his European allies. So I think that what's interesting to see is that in these regions, especially in Africa, uh, which are not probably of vital interest uh, for the United States, at least for, for the moment, because they have so many challenges to deal with, the transatlantic partnership is going to be even more important because the Americans are going to you know, be willing to rely more and more on uh, their European uh, partners, and France in particular, who has you know, particular historical ties with a few of these African countries, and so it makes sense to you know, recognize uh, the French leadership. Right. Now we've spoken a lot of uh, a lot about uh, specific examples, um, specific regions. Um, is there a possibility or a chance to summarize Obama's new foreign policy, or is there at all <laughs> a new foreign policy? <laughs> well, that's um, uh, that's a question that um, uh, you know uh, we've been asking uh, uh, the Obama administration quite often. Uh, I think that one thing that has um, really uh, distinguished Obama from uh, his predecessor, George W. Bush, is the fact that he's not a doctrine president. And he said that very well. I'm not a doctrine president. I don't want to you know, kind of uh, put a homogeneous image on the world or in certain regions. Uh, remember, Bush had this uh, agenda for freedom uh, doctrine for the Middle East and others. Um, I wouldn't say Obama has a, a specific vision. I would say maybe one strong point he has underlined during his first mandate and he will continue to do is put the emphasis on the role of big emerging powers uh, such as Brazil, uh, such as South Africa, um, such as India, for example, as emerging or e already emerged powers that have to be empowered and that have to be better associated to the international uh, decision making. And I think this has probably been a very strong uh, trend in Obama's foreign policy and it's in a certain way uh, to kind of you know, preempt um, possible or potential uh, negative attitudes on the international scene by saying, well, let's all work together even though we have uh, different point of views. Uh, let's work on issues such as maritime security, food security, climate change. So there is a whole set of issues where Obama is trying to you know, associate these big emerging powers. I would say this to me is a very, uh, a very strong point. And the second one is, is a more, I would say, instrumental uh, aspect, the fact that he also you know, wants to develop other uh, types of uh, tools of foreign policy and kind of, as he used to say, demilitarize U.S. foreign policy. Uh, every one of his speeches, and if you look at John Kerry's addition uh, or hearing in front of the Senate a few days ago, he said a uh, foreign policy equals economic policy. So I'm going to, we're probably going to see Obama putting more emphasis on economic, on trade, uh, including with Europe, but also with Canada and other countries, uh, putting an emphasis on you know, energetic issues. Um, and uh, that's probably, and, and of course diplomacy. I mean, if you look at Iran, uh, he's really focusing on the diplomatic uh, aspects. So I would say these are the two elements, I would say, that kind of characterizes Obama and foreign policy. You just mentioned John Kerry. Um, he's now appointed to the position of the foreign minister um, of the US. Do you think he might change Obama's policy, uh, foreign policy, at least a bit? Um, I'm not sure, even though Hillary Clinton was one of the, um, I would say, uh, architects of the pivot to Asia. What's interesting is that the two architects of this uh, pivot to Asia, Hillary Clinton and Kurt Campbell have left. Now it's John Kerry. Uh, John Kerry is a um, very um, subtle diplomat. Uh, as we say in French, he's a, a, a diplomat de coulisses, you know. He, um, uh, he, he was uh, one of the, he was actually the first US high 
a political representative to meet, for example, with um, Morsi before he was president and after he was president of Egypt. Um, he was, you know, more or less sent as special envoy to Afghanistan and Pakistan under uh, the first, first Obama administration. So I think he will play a much more um, sort of uh, behind the scenes diplomatic role and that's crucial because in many difficult parts of the world US diplomacy will be more and more relying on this sort of you know pragmatic strategic relationship with um, complicated leaders I think that's a nice uh, closing statement um, many thanks for spending your time here at Sons from Mars and, my pleasure um, we hope we can see you again hope so too thank you very thank much you.